Good morning, everyone. Um, Stephen Davis. I wear two hats, but they're actually increasingly more like one hat. So I, I work with C40 Cities as a city advisor to the city of Cape Town, um, but I'm also sort of a staff member in the Sustainable Energy Markets uh, Department, where a lot of where all of the, the sort of climate change, uh, particularly the mitigation work, is is being driven from within the city. Um, so feel quite uh, comfortable standing. I also used to work for ICLE on similar work a little while ago, so it feels like a, a sort of homely space to be in. And also very, um, you know, very excited to be here. The reason I was very keen to you know, participate in this, besides having some interesting conversations with Paul and Harrow, is that um, I think although they are trying to, you know, the, urban, the metabolism of cities is trying to strengthen the the, the role that, it, that thinking can play in, in sort of policy and, and planning, I think, you know, for me it's a great, um, and for our team, it's a gr great opportunity to see how that thinking can strengthen the work that we're doing in terms of driving a very ambitious uh, carbon, uh, carbon neutral target in this, uh, from, from the city's perspective. So, as Hara mentioned, you know, the city has uh, committed to a, a target. Uh, the target is in line with um, what C40 is uh, promoting. It's carbon neutrality for all of its cities by 2050. And um, that uh, goes alongside with, uh, it's, it's complemented by a, a, a SA Buildings program and Leslie here is, is uh, championing that, that particular piece of work which is um, aiming for carbon neutral new build uh, by 2030. And the city is also aiming for uh, you know, city uh, you know, uh, carbon neutrality in all buildings by, by 2050 as well. Um, we're not doing this alone. It's, uh, the other three major metros in South Africa are also C40 cities and also signed up to this program which is called Deadline 2020. There are 80 cities worldwide that have also committed to this target and C40 is, is working to support cities to, to drive uh, towards those targets. Um, yeah, so for this audience, I don't even think it's worth saying, well, why are we going for, for carbon neutrality? But um, we are seeing that, you know, the, the idea of carbon neutrality is actually not really about, about carbon at all. Um, Although I don't know if there's any actual proof that you know, carbon neutrality will produce that kind of city, I think intuitively most people feel that, that it is. And we are also, part of our role is, is to try and sort of strengthen the evidence base that's showing if we lower carbon, if we reduce it to zero, we are creating a more equitable city, a more inclusive city, a more sustainable city, um, and a more livable and safe city. Okay, why cities? Well, you know, a lot of, uh, a lot of emissions uh, happens in cities and it's, and it's increasing. Um, in some ways, city-wide carbon neutrality, so we have, we have challenges defining what that means and, and you know, people always asking, like, what does that mean to be carbon neutral as a city? So it's not just the city operations, it's the whole city. So everything that happens in the city with regards to mobility, with regards to energy we consume in buildings, with regards to our waste production has a, has a carbon impact. And the aim is that by 2050, the net zero emissions from all of that, if you take into account some minor carbon sinks from you know, sort of natural areas and biodiverse areas, um, and maybe a little bit of offsets uh, that we reach actually net, net zero. Um, but in some ways, like focusing only on a city is a little bit artificial because the city interacts with the surrounding areas and there's transboundary issues. However, there's real value in focusing on driving change at the city level from, because the city can, is, is much more in contact with what its citizens' needs are. It is a strong force for planning in the local, uh, the local area and it drives policy, it produces plans. 
So who better to, to drive the change than, than, than the city? That doesn't mean we necessarily, as a city, have to do it all, but we need to create the right environment for that, uh, that shift to happen. Okay, so how are we doing this? Well, by signing up to the Deadline 2020 program, a lot of research uh, went into what it would take for s the, the major cities in the world uh, to, to avoid this 1.5 degrees you know, that Harrow was just talking about in the IPCC report. And uh, that means that, you know, essentially carbon neutrality for all the, all the major cities by, by 2050. And so the city has committed uh, at a political level to that. Um, there was some research that went into, well, what do you focus on if you want to do that? Um, and a major part of it, uh, well, so that comes from a, a report called Focused Acceleration, which McKinsey put together. And they said, uh, they did a whole bunch of research looking at different city types uh, there were, I think, six city typologies in, that they looked at. And this shows more or less the, the, uh, w where those emission reductions will come from. So 60% is from our energy consumption, um, you know, more, efficient, more efficient energy use, but also cleaning up the energy supply. Um, and the, those bars show the ranges for the different typologies. For some cities, they have to work more on that. For some cities, they have to work less on that, depending. You know, so for South African cities, we're quite carb carbon dependent because of our electricity supply. So for that, we, ha we actually have an opportunity to reduce emissions, you know, that, uh, a big opportunity to reduce emissions uh, by cleaning up the energy supply. Um, 30% of those reductions will come from what we do about mobility and the, the terminology there is moving to next generation mobility, which is either you know, better planning of the city so people don't need to travel as much. Uh, that's the spatial planning work that uh, and the city is doing, um, has some good work going on in that space. It's um, about improving public transport, about making non-motorized transport opportunities more uh, more accessible and safer and, and, you know, more appealing. And then whatever's left that we have to do by motorized transport, that it needs to be cleaner fuels. So either, you know, um, sort of electric vehicles or, yeah, sort of clean fuel vehicles. Um, and Mary, also in our team, also has, is working on uh, uh, this sort of framework for, for that in, in the city as well, like electric vehicles particularly. And then the, the last 10% is the um, waste management. So that's about where 10% of the reductions can come from. And that includes wastewater as well. Okay, um, the city's, you know, I, I work for C40. I think the city's been doing climate change work a lot longer than C40's even been around. And uh, in 2015, there was a, a sustainable energy and climate action plan and the energy 2040 goals which made some commitments but that was before um, you know most of the world woke up and realized that actually you know we need to be very ambitious you know and there was still at that point a view that developing countries cities still need to develop and there's still space for us to you know increase our emissions as long as we start working to reduce them that's, that's very quickly in the last few years has turned out to no longer be sufficient. So where we were headed, which, uh, you know, with all of the, the sort of measures and actions that were, were put in the plan or that, that, were, that, that were come up with in, in 2015, the sort of bottom green or orange dotted line there, we now need to sort of radically um, reduce that. So we're looking now at, at you know, how to do that. And where we started was um, internally we had a, a workshop that, uh, where we kicked off this program internally in the city and that happened last year in October, I think, or November. And what we did there is we got all of the uh, senior people in the city together and we said, well, let's create a vision firstly for what is, this, what is a carbon neutral city, or what does a carbon neutral Cape Town actually look like? And this is an infographic which basically shows, you know, everything that, um, that we needed to do and, and also in an appealing way. So it was quite challenging because we had to have conversations about, well, 
you know, what sort of neighborhoods do you live in? Con conversations about how integrated is our society, you know, compared to how it is now. Um, so this conversation is not always comfortable, but I think everyone's kind of aware of, of what our challenges are and how the, f the future of our city, you know, being consistent with a carbon neutral vision is actually just a better city. Um, so we found, we felt very positive after this workshop because people were not saying to us, oh, why are you still focusing on carbon? Everyone was just saying, well, okay, how? You know, just show us, you know, help us out here. How are we going to get there? Um, really mentioned this in the focused acceleration, but it just explains again what, um, you know, what, uh, what, what we're going to be focusing on the development of our action plan. Um, and I've already mentioned the system boundary issues, you know, why we, we are adopting a city-wide focus. Because, of course, uh, the city has control over a certain amount of things that can influence other things and it has broader concern about other things. So, um, you know, we, we are having a lot of conversations with uh, our colleagues in the city about, well, what, what can we directly influence and control through policy and through in, uh, the infrastructure that we build, but then what role can we play in advocacy and, um, you know, what are some of the sort of broader things that are maybe further away from our control, things like what residents consume and the products that they consume and where those products come from, uh, which we have possibly, you know, less, uh, less influence or control over, but still a concern because it affects, you know, I guess the metabolism of our city. Um, a lot of the work that we are also sort of focusing on is how do we, we mainstream the target within the city. So, Considering spatial planning, considering land use, um, the city's catalytic sites, and sorry, the, it's not so visible on there, but transport planning and, and operations. And all of this, there's a whole bunch of steps that need to happen in order for this to be absorbed into the city. So that it's not just always an additional thing, something that the environmental, you know, and the climate change people are working on, but actually it's, it affects every decision that's made um, about new projects, about strategies, about plans. Um, and yeah, I'm very happy that our s strategic policy unit colleagues are also in, in, in the room today because we're also working with, with them and um, yeah, pulling in the same direction when it, comes to, um, when it comes to succeeding with this work. Uh, we're not doing this alone and increasingly we're going to be reaching out more and more to uh, the, the citizens and to business and to NGOs and the research institutions and uh, we also have the support of people like uh, groups like Sustainable Energy Africa and, and C40 through all of the, the various networks um, and it's really great to be in this program with the other major metros because there's some changes that you know we say well only if national government implements X, Y, Z policy. Uh, we are together, uh, for the four metros, we are actually able to advocate together. So if the four metros are all s sort of committed to the same thing, we feel that actually puts a lot of pressure on our sort of local, our provincial governments, but also our national government to kind of, to get on board with that. So we, I mean, these targets are much more ambitious than what's, what's currently in the national plans and what the what the in the nationally determined contributions are uh, from the South African government, um, but we're also saying that it's not just uh, because of the carbon, but it's because it's actually going to be better for for our cities' develop development if we commit to such targets. Okay, I thought I'd give a, a bit of a sense of what from a carbon and perspective what what the picture currently looks like uh, because this sort of leads into the the metabolism conversation quite directly um, so most of our emissions come from our energy consumption and the electricity we use um, even though a lot of it is not produced locally um, none of the electricity emissions really happen locally it's all um, imported so uh, from elsewhere in the country, but nonetheless our carbon footprint is largely because of the, the electricity we use in our commercial sector and our residential sector. Uh, about 30% of it, uh, of the emissions is from transport, 
and yeah, then the rest from local government agriculture. And the trend over the past few years, so this is an assessment that's done. There's not, you know, it's not perfect data, uh, but, you know, it's, 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 it's pretty good. And we would say, you know, that this, I, this view that the emissions have stabilized over the last few years is, is, is probably a fair reflection. Um, and, yeah, we keep, we monitor our emissions, we do an annual update, and we'll do a deep, deep update every five years uh, to, to better understand our energy and carbon picture. So the most uh, recent detailed um, uh, state of energy report that we did was for, was in 2015, but it was based on 2012 data, and that shows, uh, and th these graphs show where the, where the emissions come from, um, but there you can see in the top left, you know, if you look at it from an energy perspective, it's quite different uh, from a carbon perspective, and that's because of the, the, the dirty energy. Um, but, you know, a lot of our energy consumption is still uh, from in the transport sector, so that's, and that's largely driven by the fact that we have, you know, this huge uh, energy consumption from the private vehicles uh, in our city. Um, even though a lot of, most people are still using some kind of public transport. Um, yeah, and then also when you start, so a lot of the, one of the requirements of the action plan is that it's got to be inclusive. You know, it's not just, yeah, it's got to be something that addresses inequality and unemployment and equi you know, equity within the city. And when you look at the, the energy consumption picture down below, you can see you know, that most of the energy that, that's consumed is actually by, by the high income. And so there's a, you know, while you want to reduce the emissions there, you also, we're also aware that there's a lot of people living in energy poverty. Um, so how do you address both at the same time and uh, drive your emissions down? And those are the kinds of, um, we, we're developing projects and initiatives which are aimed at addressing both. Um, so that's one way of looking at, at carbon and emissions, but increasingly cities are needing to look at their consumption-based footprints as well. And consum the, the, the consumption-based emissions is, is a different way of, of looking at emissions, and it looks at you know, how much you're importing and exporting as well. So, and, and this is increasingly relevant in... in in the developed countries, because cities like Paris, they've actually included consumption-based emissions in their plans because they recognize that, you know, consumption was always this elephant in the room. You know, you can clean up your, your energy system and you can recycle everything and you can have a circular sort of economy in, in, through many lenses. But if you are, you know, importing a lot of products from the developed world, you're basically just exporting your emissions. So you need to also consider what, you know, try and localize your, your production uh, more and more and also, you know, not just believe that you can, you know, just drive, drive the economy up by, by having more people consume more things. Um, so, yeah, and I just, I didn't want to sort of spend too much time on, on this. We didn't do this. Uh, the work was done by C40. It's also based on, on very sort of broad assumptions. Uh, it's quite difficult to get the data to do a, a, a very detailed consumption-based emissions inventory. But you can see there, like, in electricity features, but, um, you know, yeah, of course the meat, uh, you know, meat consumption is, is a big contributor as well, and that's why, you know, we're seeing more and more people say, well, we actually just need to eat less meat, and that would make a huge impact on our overall carbon footprint. Um, if you look at consumption-based emissions, it was, this is for 2012, it's about 30, 30 million con uh, tons of CO2, whereas the, um, the sector-based emissions was around 22. So that means that we're actually sort of a, net, um, a net importer of, of emissions if you look at the whole sort of consumption, if you include consumption as well. And I'm sorry, you can't see the, the details there, but... Um, yeah. Also, don't know how much more. How are we doing for time? Sort of. 
five minutes. Okay. All right. So I won't, I mean, I can show you some more details of that for people who are interested. Uh, but where we are at the moment, so we are doing, uh, we have an emissions model and we are looking at where can the required emissions reductions come from and what are the sort of policies and measures that we can put in place, uh, taking into account what's happening at the national level. So where we were headed is the sort of top line, okay, if we just did nothing. Business as usual, we just, our emissions would just keep going up until 2050. If you include what's happening at a national level, so the new integrated resource plan, which lays out what our electricity mix is going to look like um, towards 2050, then already our job is made a bit easier because we know the government is committed to having more renewables and less coal. Still not as ambitious as it could be, um, and I guess there's political reasons why they can't just say no more coal, but, and, and also social reasons, but um, yeah, we think that, that you know, we have a good chance of, of that actually turning out to be quite different uh, with various pressures. And we also can see that we, there's still some gains to be made from private building energy efficiency, from our own, from generating our own electricity within the city boundary. Um, so all of those colored bars show if we just implement successfully all of our existing policies and, and plans and everything that's currently on the table, then we actually will see a, a slight reduction uh, by, by 2050, but that's obviously still a big gap. So from the bottom of the green line to the bottom there, that's where we need to, that's the conversation we're having now. It's like, what else, what else can be done? What else can we, we drive? So, and now I'm just gonna quickly run through. So what does this look like in reality? So the city has a lot of projects that are already sort of guiding guiding us in, in the direction we want to go. And I'm just going to use pictures just to, to illustrate. Um, you know, so bottom there you can see that the sort of spatial planning stuff, but also all the, the city operations, you know, and, and what we're doing with, with PV on, on some of our own buildings and what some private sector buildings are doing, um, you know, by implementing their own embedded generation. Uh, there's a court case that we have currently underway to try and um, allow the city to procure its own um, uh, energy from independent power producers because the regulations don't currently allow for that. Um, we have, uh, you know, campaigns to promote uh, rooftop solar and energy efficiency. Um, and then previous communication campaigns that you might be familiar with. So this is historic, but we're going to be looking at this, uh, looking at a new, newer communication campaign starting quite soon. Uh, we have the Energy, Water and Waste Forum, where um, we reach out, uh, we convene and facilitate a, a gathering, very, various uh, private sector entities to come together and share their experiences on uh, improving energy efficiency and, and increasing renewables, but also looking at water and waste. Um, highlighting some of the economic benefits of some of the climate actions. So this is a solar water heater example, which, you know, is often nice to illustrate that if you, you know, you promote solar water heating take, take up, you, you're not, you're keeping money in the local economy, you're creating jobs, you are saving electricity, and you are putting money back in people's pockets. Um, yeah, development criteria, so, trying to ensure that, you know, new developments, um, you know, are energy, as energy efficient as possible, both in the operation and in the, uh, in the embedded emissions in the building materials. For low income houses, ceilings and solar water heaters, so there's some projects that we have going on there. And, yeah, other examples of, of um, you know, trying to have small businesses and others supporting energy efficiency projects and renewable energy and improving energy security at the same time. The city spatial development framework, um, basically instead of having the, the sprawling, uh, you know, the sort of default urban sprawl, 
uh, development is now going to be concentrated um, for this, on this inward growth and uh, sort of densified mixed use. And there's that, that blue turtle which, uh, where the growth concentration is, is meant to happen and along, also along the corridors. So this is a way of avoiding having people have to travel so far to get to, to economic opportunities. Uh, housing specifications, you know, if houses are well located and compact. Um, and then of course, public transport. Of course, a major thing that we need to sort out is our rail system. It's the backbone of transportation and um, there are some efforts underway, and you might have seen in the media, you know, what we're trying to do to get, um, get the rail system working well again. Non-motorized transport, and then some of the waste product, uh, projects, the organic to landfill project uh, is happening. Obviously, we need to, need to do, a, we can do a lot more there as well. And then, of course, leading by example. So everything that the city is, is doing in its own operations is uh, trying to set, set an example of what, what others can do. Sorry, I rushed through those last few a bit, but if anyone's got any more questions, um, I or my colleagues here can also uh, answer specific questions about the projects.